So this is the electrical board, and it's just, like I said, a piece of plywood, and um, I painted it, you know, to try to match the car a little bit. I feel really bad that I don't have a piece of metal for this, but at the same time, I don't have the money to go out and buy stuff like that just, you know, just because it would look cool. And um, I think metal would be safer um, because it's not combustible, but I'm hoping, hopefully it won't come to that. Um, anyway, so I've got three drivers mounted, and these are the proprietary five-phase drivers for motors. And these are cool because they have, uh, this is 110 AC, and this is actually out to the motor, and this is for control, and there's little adjustments not only for run, but stop. Um, but uh, the thing that makes these cool is the power supply is built in. That's what I like. And even with, you know, modern two-phase drivers, I'm surprised nobody makes a little case with, like, a little Palulu driver and a power supply. I think that'd be a, a good little product. And the idea is you wouldn't have wall warts for each one. Marketing-wise, this was a great idea because you just buy these things and you bolt them on and they're all ready to go. You don't have to have integrate power supplies with drivers. Anyhow, I've got a big line, AC line cord here of a heavy-duty plug. Um, this is used, but, it, you know, I chopped a few inches off of each end to make sure that um, the wear was gone. Actually, the dive from this string is actually coming off on it. Anyway, this is plenty tough enough for it, and it doesn't seem to have a lot of use, uh, so I'm just going to use that. And um, it seems it would be appropriate for, like, you know, 15 to 20 amps. Um... So, on this side, I've got, um, I wanted a few different things. I wanted, um, I wanted one circuit for the accessories, which I just have an, a an AC outlet strip here. I, w I wanted another circuit for the stepper motors and a third one for the spindle motor. And um, I found this little industrial outlet, and oddly enough, this was wired wrong. Here in the United States, this is supposed to be, um, this is supposed to be white or neutral. This is supposed to be black uh, for hot, and this is supposed to be ground door. It is not energized. Um, but anyway, so I mounted this on. I put a little gap under here so air still might flow to the uh, stepper drivers. And in between, I mounted these little uh, common mode choke power filters. And while these have capacitors inside them, and they are old and used, um, I think that, I, or I should say, I doubt that they're electrolytic, so they're probably okay for this application. Um, like ceramic capacitors last a long time. Um, these cases are grounded, and they expect a ground wire on them. And um, so this is one deviation from a star ground scenario. And uh, once again, if you're doing electrical, you do so at your own risk. If you screw up, it, following my instructions or even your own and you burn down your house and everything, I would feel bad, but it's not my responsibility. And I'm just showing you what I did. Um, but otherwise, I try to have a, a, a star ground situation. And uh, so, and in places, I ran two ground wires on a single, um, on a single terminal. As you can see, although these are crimp terminals, that I, um, I pulled the, the, um, the insulator off of them, I crimped them, and soldered each one. And uh, at factories, they have very good crimp tools, and this is a personal preference of mine, and once again, do it your own risk, but I like to crimp and solder these kind of connectors. I didn't feel that the crimper I had could produce a good enough crimp where I wouldn't worry about it, and um, so these aren't going anywhere. Although this heat treat tubing probably won't put up with as much abrasion as the original connectors, they're also longer too. There's a little cap that goes off of here. I was, I'm, I'm in the process of putting on ground connectors, so I had taken this off. And at some point, I've got to, uh, I'll probably tape these up and put something going over here to make sure that nothing shorts out. And, um, and uh, you know, you want to, I want to be safe, but I want to make sure most of this is together before I start buttoning it up. I've got right now four relays mounted, and right now only one's wired. Um, these are uh, 120 volt, and these are double throw, and um, single pole double throw. Um, one side's normally open, the other side's normally closed, and um, it takes 120 volts to energize, the, energize these as far as the coils. I also have two 5 volt relays, and those are not implemented yet. And uh, these appear to be digital relays or, you know, MOSFET kind of things or something or TRIAC or what have you. Um, so, and I try to keep this neat and try to keep the wires under control. I even braided them here. And uh, 
these have little 10 millimeter screws and stuff like that these are exceedingly tight these are cute little modules too and um, I also tried to put these um, common mode filters um, downstream from the relays so so the relay noise will not will be filtered out before these are um, you know before the, at the filter before they reach wherever they're gonna reach before I started um, wiring this board, I had some idea of what I was making. And um, one of the first things I did is reverse engineer this relay. I basically took the relay and I took it out of its socket. And uh, this is just a socket, as you can see. I can get out. Yeah. So, so basically, there's coil contacts and and, um, and contacts for the, uh, you know, for the basically to do the switching. There's normally open, normally closed, and common contacts, and then there's coil contacts. And it came up with kind of a plan. Um, so I've got an AC line cord, and this is this little terminal block. And for wherever I put these little common mode chokes, I put like a little filter symbol. And um, here's the outlet strip on one circuit. On the second circuit, I put um, the drivers. And you can see there's another filter here in the drivers. And I'm going to have a switched uh, one of these relays for um, some kind of cooling. And, um, and uh, as far as the spindle motor, I'm waiting on the spindle motor right now. Um, I've got, because uh, I don't know exactly how, I, I think, I'm thinking I'm going to have a real hardware, honest to goodness, um, um, emergency stop that shuts off everything except for the computer. Um, and um, so we, I, I know most user interfaces for um, CNC controllers and stuff, you've got like a, an emergency stop button. I think I'm gonna have to a little one and a big one. As far as the circuits, this was a little was a little confusing because I did want one circuit for accessories, just an outlet you can plug computers in that's not switched, and then stepper. Uh, this uh, stepper motor and the spindle motors will both be controlled by relays, and I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna wire those up yet. I've got the stepper motor on the relay, and maybe the spindle motor will go from one ray to, to another relay. I'm not sure. Um, I imagine that the spindle motor is software controlled as well through the um, variable frequency driver, but um, I might have one one um, relay or set of relay contacts to shut off the spindle motor entirely. And so this is still a work in progress. Down here by the down spot, you can see the complete mess of, of tools and wires that um, I, I need to um, be able to wire the machine. First of all, I had no idea just how much wire um, this has taken. I've got a lot of cable I've been saving up for years and um, and um, I'm going to use up like one third of it on this machine. And I figured there's over 75 feet of cable on just the low voltage side. So this is some of the tools I use for soldering. Obviously, um, I've got a soldering a little soldering station here. And this is an old one, but you know what? This tip still works, and this tip is so old, and I don't know why. It just works, and so I'm happy about that. I like that this little soldering station is only one piece, and it's, its footprint is relatively small, and it's relatively heavy, so it stays in place. Um, the new ones, as far as I can tell, I don't even know if they make a narrow one such as this. I think you have a two-piece thing, which if you're working outside like this or if you're moving or moving it around and not working on one particular bench, then it's um, then that's not as convenient as this one. Oddly enough, even though this is a very fine soldering iron, it goes hot enough, and um, I don't usually take it above 400, but uh, even at 350, this will solder... Um, and this has enough uh, thermal capacity to uh, to um, solder like uh, 14 gauge stuff and uh, um, and maybe even a little bit thicker. And it goes down enough that you can do very fine soldering. And um, so a good soldering station. And um, I also have a, a, a little marker for marking um, which wires which as far as which channel. I've got some flux, but I'm not using it as, as much as I thought I would. Um, I've got a little uh, a little vise here of plastic jaws, which is swivel, which um, um, is okay. And um, <clears throat> the nice thing about the jaws is they don't crush anything, but you have to be careful not to get anything too hot in them. I've got one of these little third hand things, and I hate these things. And I think the line lock ones might be better. But um, the biggest problem with these is the jaws. The jaws have teeth in them, which sink into whatever your you know whatever wires you're trying to solder. I've got a little, uh, an old-fashioned heat sink, 
which is aluminum, which is, you can clamp this onto a wire and it'll keep the heat from traveling up the wire and activating the heat, the, uh, heat shrink tubing. I've got two pairs of strippers. And I don't feel that these uh, put enough of crimp in them by themselves to, um, for me to really trust, um, it, it, you know, the job it does in crimp connectors. So I solder them and put heat shrink tubing. And um, I've got a coarse one of the, uh, you've got a coarse one and I have a fine one for doing finer wires. And this also gets into places that that can't. I've got two pairs of diagonal cutters. I've got a, a coarse one and a fine one. And I, for, for stripping housings and stuff, I've got, in cutting housings, I've got a pair of scissors. I've got a cable cutter too, but you know what? I don't use it that much. I often use the scissors to trim the ends of um, wire after I skin it if it's too long because it does a nicer job than diagonal cutters. I've got a, a, a knife, a nice safe knife, relatively safe knife for, um, for, stri for stripping um, cable housings. I've got a little, um, you know, a little exacto blade. I've got um, at least three things for manipulating, you know, like, like pliers, two pliers, one pair of fi very fine forceps for manipulating stuff while I'm soldering it. Um, these have a, a fairly, you know, they're not too aggressive on the inside. Of course, I have solder. I've got glasses. Di these are just Dime Star adapter glasses because I feel I do a better job like this. And plus, while I'm getting older, I have heat shrink tubing. And I, I tend to cut up the tubing in little segments ahead of time. Um, I'm outside. I don't have a heat gun, so I'm just using a, a propane torch. Also, I'm using uh, these, these uh, military connectors. And normally I wouldn't bother to use something like this, but these contacts are 14 amps, and I wanted to try. And um, generally I would just get like DB9s, because I need five wires for the motors. I would just get uh, DB, uh, DB9s, <clears throat> but they only handle two amps each. And um, I'm not pushing more than two amps, but I like the idea of this. I want to try these because they're, they're convenient that um, they do have 14 pins, but they're, they're a pain to solder. <coughs> Excuse me, because... You know, it gets a little dense in the middle here. And I tend when I... See, and that's the other thing. You have to be careful. The pins fall out. But anyway, when I'm soldering them, they... Uh, I'm not going to edit that out either. Um, when I'm soldering these, I start from the inside and work my way out. And um, there's all kinds of parts for these things. Um, I'm reusing these so they have snap rings, little C-clips in them, which are really hard to take out. Um, a bunch of screws. I like love the string relief on these and um, so I'm gonna try using these I'm obviously gonna round up all the pins on this. That's why I've got this in a little box Unfortunately, I couldn't find these little uh, these little connectors that um, Without the little plastic thing. So I did do is I take two pairs of pliers I try not to uh, scratch the uh, plating and I just pull this off and discard this part um, <clears throat> I'm building a ground wire here and this is kind of funny because it's um, it has um, it's got two wires on one side and it has two ground straps to go to the machine on the other side. I just want the machine frame grounded, and that comes that has its safety bonuses and its drawbacks. The, draw, the safety bonuses it's grounded, and um, the safe the, the bad part is that if you drop a hot wire on it, it will spark. So uh, once again, I uh, I tend to uh, crimp these. Yeah, I, I crimp these, solder them, and put heat shrink on them. And I tried the crimper the other way around, and it didn't even do as good as this. I crimped it on the back. I tried to get it in the center, and I really press on these things. And uh, I'm going to use the, uh, the little alligator clip one because it doesn't melt. And I tried to remember to put the heat shrink tubing on it. And uh, that's not always easy. I've forgotten it before. I don't know. I've, I think if you solder enough of these things, eventually you'll probably forget to put like a, a connector or heat shrink or something on uh, on a cable and uh, so I've got a fine soldering iron and I've got fine solder so I have to be prepared to feed a lot of it into the uh, joint and I clean the tip I've got a damp sponge I like the sponge because it doesn't scratch the uh, it doesn't scratch the tip and it pulls a lot of the oxide off but it cools down the iron and it takes a couple seconds to get a recovery and if you want you could put a little drop of flux on here but um, for, for, for right now I'm gonna try just kind of feeding this on and um, this is kind of a dual thing because um, you're supposed to have the um, the connector and the wire both touching the tip at the same time but it's not always easy to do that sometimes it's easier to use the solder to uh 
to uh, to actually carry the heat and stuff. And eventually it will just drop right in there and wick into the wire. So I'm going to feed it there. It's just wick. It, so this area has just gotten hot enough. So it's actually soaking in. Doing this, it does have a drawback that if you feed enough of solder, it will travel all the way down the wire, melting the insulation. And you have to be aware that if you feed enough, that will actually make this part not flexible. And that's another reason why you need the uh, the heat shrink is just to protect to, to protect that. So I've gotten this good good and hot, so I feel like it's traveled pretty far down. I think it's almost dripping there, but that's okay. And you can see the flux on the outside. Um, <clears throat> This machine is not going to be forever, so I'm not too worried about cleaning the flux. And so the, this is the hard part, is letting this thing cool down before you try uh, heat sh shrieking the tubing. Uh, sometimes if they get close, just the heat traveling down the wire will make the heat shrink activate. And um, so sometimes uh, sometimes if you take a little, a little heat sink and you put that on there, that'll help it to form the insulation here. But it helps sink some of the heat from traveling down the wire and activating the heat shrink tubing. I found that um, if, if this does start to close up, um, probably the, what helps is to take a blunt object and gently just kind of round it out a little bit like, like this. And um, it's, because this, this is really aggravating when this happens. Also, you should, you know, I really think you should be doing this in a ventilated area. Um, so there's soldering fumes. I'm not even worried about the rods, and I'm not worried about the solder. The thing I'm worried about is the wire. So this wire is polyvinyl chloride. Well, the chlorine is not especially good for you. It mixes with organic uh, material, making all these side reactions. What I'm afraid of is the stuff that makes wire soft. So if you go to Home Depot and you look at the plumbing pipe, it's all hard and tough. And the reason why this is, is soft is because they put phthalates in it, and the phthalates do not stay in the wire, generally. It's hard to mix phthalates with um, plastic. I don't think phthalates are especially good for you. When I get done doing this, before I go in or you know have a snack or something, I'm make sure to wash my hands every time, like twice, with a lot of soap to try to get a lot of this residue off. Um, a lot of times I work with gloves. I can't seem to find my fine gloves and stuff, but... Um, Anyway, that's what I, uh, I do. I try to, you know, be careful and stuff. And I believe this is just feeling the wire in here. I believe that this is um, now um, cool enough to uh, take this out and just kind of coax the heat shrink tubing up. And uh, like I say, I, I like the heat shrink a lot better than, um, than um, just, just this alone. But there is, the, the cool thing about this stuff is it's thick. And so this doesn't have as much abrasion resistance, but you can see it's longer too. Um, I used to work for uh, an, uh, a kid car company and all their harnesses were all done like this. Every single connector was done like this and I admired them for this. This is how I like to do it. I wish I had th thicker heat shrink though. I recommend that you heat, heat shrink um, with a heat gun or a hot air gun and stuff, but if you don't have one, in, a, in, a, in the slightest of pinch, you could use a, a torch and you have to be very careful not to get the um, the wire warm and you don't want to get too close to it or it will smoke and once again I, I don't know how bad the polyolefin is for you the heat shrink is polyolefin I believe but the um, the um, the uh, phthalates in the wire are no good for you and I tend not to overdo it and try to not mess with it until it cools down I got this nice uh, emergency stop switch and um, the contacts are rated for like, like for it says five amps on here, and it says uh, something else elsewhere. I think it says uh, six hundred volts, uh, ten amps on this on the contacts. Anyhow, so you're not going to be doing any real heavy lifting with this. But what I wanted this for is I wanted this for a main power switch, and also I wanted this for an emergency stop, and. Um, the switch itself has, um, once it's installed, I think it'll have no metal um, exposed. I mean, um, you know, I don't think there'll be any metal somewhere. So what I want is um, an insulated box. And so I went to Home Depot and I got this box. And um, so it's just an electrical box, plastic. And I think it cost me like, uh, well, this and this together cost me like a $1.50 or $1.60 or something. This stuff is so, such mass massively uh, Produced. Um, also, I had to add just two screws. It doesn't come with screws. So I'm just going to put it underneath here and take a, a claw hammer. Let's see if we can just barely see this. Yes. 
and just pull the nails out like this using a little bit of space provided by the uh I got two free nails out of it. So I'm gonna grind, cut this off with some diagonal cutters and then just grind it with a, a sander. And this box just fits in here nicely with a little room left over. And I want it all plastic. Oddly, there's gonna be 120 volts going through the switch. And that switch will operate the main relay. Uh, just, it just energized the coil. There'll be very little current just to, to uh, the um the, you know the current from the relay and um, basically i turn on the whole kit and caboodle except for the accessory which is always on so if you get the emergency stop i don't think i want the computer being shut off so that's what i've been doing i'm wiring this in um i moved this fastener over here so and so now i've got uh, four wire, wire, uh, wire clamps on this side and um and uh, the, the bolts do double duty. I have an extra hole. I hate when that happens, but you know, I'm not drawing all this stuff out. And um, um, I thought this could have fit a little bit tighter. Uh, this thing is on, on here with a death grip. But this I thought was a little loose, so I took two zip ties and I, and I tightened them to just a point and just until it starts to deform and dig into the cable a little bit. Not too much. You know what? You know, you, generally you don't want to kill stuff with your zip ties. You just need them to hold the wire. Um, and I've got it wired in, and um, actually I want this under here. I try to, you know, take the stress off the wiring, and not have it too tight, not have it too loose. Uh, if it's too, if it hangs under its weight, then it, that's not good. I'd probably put one zip tie here, just to keep it all together. But um, I try to keep the the wiring not too loose, not too tight. If you constrict it too much, it'll probably fail at the ends. If it's too loose, just from moving, it'll fail at the ends. So um, usually at the ends. So um, you know, it's getting there. So so I unfortunately they didn't have the proper lid, so I've got to cut the lid too, and I got to have to figure out how I'm going to put a hole in it. This seems like a ridiculously simple uh, schematic. I mean, uh, the the electricity, as it were, goes you know through through um through a piece of wire out the end of this cable which i've got a, a double insulated line cord i wanted something double insulated um and it goes to, then it goes through the switch the switch makes contact it comes down through the coil and to and it returns to the neutral the thing about this and the reason why i drew this schematic is what colors do i use because i'm, I'm making like a complete circuit with this and um so what what colors i wanted the um you know i kind of wanted the black on this side also on this side um uh, i uh, attached the ground to this um, cable and i'm not going to be hooking up this there's nothing to hook this up to inside of a plastic box but just for future i wanted this connected i don't want to you know have a fault i don't want to have a, a ground wire in there that's not hooked up to anything and what I'll do is I'll just put a piece of, piece of heat shrink to uh, cap it off, more or less. I found a grommet that will fit onto the uh, cord. It's not really a line cord. It was a line cord. And then you can see it's double insulated. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm taking a pair of calipers and just using the blades to uh, measure the uh, grommet. And then I'm looking at the... I've got a step drill. And I'm taking this and seeing... How, how, you know, uh, what size, and it's kind of between two sizes, and um, so uh, it should be two, two, two notches remain, and I'll try it like that first. I'm sorry, my phone's not working very well, and I've got a replacement coming for a replacement. I can't afford a GoPro or anything. Anyway, so, um, so um, I've got this, uh, this, um, it's actually a double throw switch, a double pull switch, sorry. And um, this e-stop switch uh, fits in the box fine, but once you start talking about wire, you have to worry about the minimum bend radius. And this seems to be it right about here, you know, just a little bit more than that from the center point here, going around like that. So uh, before I drill my holes, I try to make sure that um, I'm going to be able to bend the wire around. And it looks like I have an, uh, it looks like it's going to be okay. And uh, for putting the for putting the holes. Um, I don't want to use these knockouts because I won't be able to do uh, a proper strain relief or even or even a decent one. Um, and um, so what I want to do is put the grommet about, say, here. I'd like to put it in the middle, but that's not going to happen. And, uh, and I want to get a little away from this edge because if I put it right on the edge, it's going to crack the housing. And this is just one of these, you know, temporary things, so I'm just going to...
I'm just going to eyeball it and put a little mark there about where I want it. And I'm using a, I'm using a step drill and I want about two of these things remaining when I get done. And I'm just drill like that. These step drills are good as long as there's not too much wall thickness. And um, I should be it right there. And I'll see if the grommet fits in here. It's hard to do this. I'm trying to make sure you're at camera. And these grommets are, well, interesting. They're, they're, uh, they're Harbor Freight grommets. So I'm just going to stuff the grommet in. I'm just going to push a little grommet in with a flat bladed screwdriver. And these grommets from Harbor Freight are very plasticky and they're not very rubbery at all. This is where a real screwdriver actually helps a little bit. It's kind of thick. And we'll see if the cable fits through here. Like so. Yeah, it'll fit there. I'm going to take a little soap and water and do this. And I don't recommend using silicone unless you have to. And if you, of course, if, you, if, you're, if you're careful with soap and water, this will go in. But you should dry everything and make, and make sure everything, you know, there's no moisture in here by the time you get done. The problem with silicone, it's a contamination. If you try to do this and paint something, your paint will fall off in sheets. Uh, if you search for a fisheye reducer, you can see what a problem it is. And uh, this fits in here pretty stiff. And uh, this is going to be good. And... Um, I'm just going to feed this, pull this through, and work out some kind of strain relief. Right now, this is plugged in, and uh, temporarily, I have, um, I put a piece of heat shrink tubing over each end of these, and then I heat shrink it, and then I use electrical tape to try to get there, the rest of it, so there's no expo nothing exposed over there. I'm trying to be good with this idea, but they, they use electrical tape and like most municipal like light poles and stuff that I've seen, and they still they've used electrical tape for a long time. Um, I tended to be a little excessive, so I think I'm gonna at some point make a cover over this. Once I f I want to find some thin plastic, I don't want to use some anything very thick for this. Once again, we're at the back of the machine. I've got the real emergency stop hooked up, and um, when you hit this button, it either turns on or turns off the whole kit and caboodle. This is a real emergency stop. It's, there's only one relay between this and, uh, and everything else. And so at the back of the machine, once again, I've got three drivers for now. Um, I'm going to try to leave room for, a, for at least a fourth, if not a fifth. Um, these are the uh, motor wires for the drivers, and these are the power wires for the drivers. So it may seem like I've got this ugly bunch of wire in here, and I did this for a reason. And I've, this is all used wire, basically, that I've, that I've pulled off of other machines. And um, including these connectors and the military connector on the other side. Um, so the idea is that if this wire goes bad or a connection goes bad or um, a, a, you know a connector or something goes bad, then I can just re-terminate it and I'll have and I won't I won't have to run more wire. So that's what the idea with the loop is. And um, over here I've got um, these are the limit switch wiring, and um, in some places like the y-axis I ran two wires and I joined them together in here forming um, a, a loop between both of them. So, so these are all normally closed and so when you, when you push a limit switch it actually opens the circuit. So I've got X, Y, and Z and uh, the one, so I've got a marked, there's no band, there's no stripe on this one, the blue is X, um, the red is Y and so this is Z here. And um, so I, I've got these, although you're not really supposed to uh, tin these leads, I want something to prevent corrosion. There's not much current going through here, hardly anything at all. So for signal wires, um, I did tin these. And, uh, but I had heard for high current wires, you're not supposed to. You might check with, uh, if you buy uh, a, a terminal strip and see what they recommend as far in the wire manufacturer. Um, I left a little space here because I'm probably going to put a fourth axis at some point in this. Who knows, maybe even this week. Um, anyway, um, I made a little uh, 3D printed box um, for the interface. And I have the interface wires running in here. And I've got the screws taken off. The idea of this box was just to protect this board and give it some, and give it some places that I could uh, tie off um, the cables and stuff for strain relief. And you should use zip ties and stuff. And I'm going to share this as soon as I get it bug free. But um, these are a little off, and I want the cover to fit a little 
a little easier without any fitting. Uh, these screw locations are just tapped. You have to tap them to three millimeters because uh, a 3D printer can't usually, you know, print uh, threads that are three millimeter um, in any kind of condition. So, so like a three millimeter tap would be a good thing if you want to use this box. Um, anyway, so inside the box, I've got one of these little parallel port boards, and um, I think I bought this for like twenty-six dollars on eBay. And um, I had some trials and tribulations with this. And first, it's, it's kind of like um, kind of a standard outlay um, a board where you've got um, a few inputs and several outputs. You have power here, and you have a DB25 uh, to connect for a parallel port of a computer. And uh, this board has a bunch of opto isolators you can see here and unfortunately they're not removable I wish they were really removable so you can upgrade it or change one if you get do it if you get a bad one and um, um, and these are Schmidt triggers which will clean up I think these are actually on the inputs it looks like they're heading over to the inputs so I believe these Schmidt triggers only work for the inputs that's my guess um, there's a couple filter capacitors here and over over here, I have all the limit switches hooked up. I've got a combination of limit and home switches, and um, I have a I actually have a jumper in here too, I believe. And um, uh, and on this side, I, these are these go out to motors, um, two for each motor. And um, these orange wires are actually to shut down the drives, and they don't they don't shut down. Unfortunately, I think they used a different kind of optical isolator, and I think they've aged to the point where I can't shut them down. That's what I suspect. Anyway, so these also my drivers are old drivers, and they use a, a forward step pin and a, and a backward step pin, so they're not standards. I like this particular board because it doesn't have a bunch of relays and stuff like that. Um, um, I wanted, I have relays, and I wanted to, um, you know, you know, decide for myself how I was going to hook this up. And um, I didn't want to have relays turning on other relays, because that doesn't make a very reliable system. Anyway, um, I had a problem with this board. That I was putting 5 volts in on this side, and um, I was checking the output, and the board was switching okay. And excuse the dog, the board was switching okay. And the only problem was that the voltage was way too low, and actually the waveform was somewhat not so good. And um, so I didn't know what to do about this. And the, the power, the uh, power configuration, and and the um, and the uh, manual for this board was not written the best, and I, I, I could not decipher it. I could not. I, um, <clears throat> maybe if they, I actually, there's a Chinese interpreter that uh, hangs out at the coffee shop, and um, maybe, maybe if they had the Chinese text, I would have tried to um, have her interpret it for me, but, but uh, there was no Chinese text either. Um, so, um, so I was faced with a dilemma. It seemed like the jumpers were to disconnect this side from this side, and um, as far as the power is concerned. And I, t I t you know, I talked with my roommate. Um, my roommate was really helpful. And I'm, I'm grateful for him. You know, he's a good electronics person, uh, a lot better than me. Um, so, so he suggested and, and, and that, uh, that I try taking the jumpers off and put more power in. And so I got a little uh, 12 volt uh, wall wart kind of thing. And I put, um, and I, I didn't, I calculated the voltage change I wanted, and I needed a few extra di additional volts. And for the remainder, I just put a diode in here on, in, in some heat shrink tubing, soldered it into the, and so it gives me like a one volt voltage drop, which will still put me under, you know, hopefully in the range I wanted. Uh, the problem is there's a bunch of resistors here, and, if, and I don't know what values are, these are. So these 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 outputs are pulled up, and these opto isolators they work like NPN transistors. They pull down, and um, the problem comes when you don't know how high it's pulled up. That's the problem. And uh, maybe if I read the codes, I probably should have done that, and we can calculate better. But um, maybe they put some other part under, you know, somewhere on this board that would have changed the results too. So, so I really needed to know what these resistors were that was they were pulled up. So, so, so the power is normally pulled up, and then when the opto isolators, um, when they when, when they connect, they pull everything to the ground. 
and the thing is I need to, needed to know what this what this resistor value was that we that were pulled up with and I didn't so I tried 12 volts and it works but it only worked after after just for this problem alone this kept me just kept me I, I was out here till like uh, 1 42 in the morning and the people at um, uh, Linux CNC, oh, they were so helpful. They were so great. And um, I really appreciate everything they did for me. And um, I was like C Linux CNC's problem child for like a week. And I really, once again, I really appreciate their help. And um, anyhow, so I got it going. And uh, the stream leaf se seemed to work okay. It's not so much, but this is in here firm. I just don't want to crush these cables. These are twisted pair cables. And and through this, this wiring here, I, I've got this um, little interface board hooked up to the uh, back of a, an old computer. Um, I try to tap these wires, you know, somewhat and everything. Um, I hate having this orange cable here, but it carries plenty of current and it's just for the monitor. Um, you know, that's how things go sometimes. I've mounted another board underneath the cart here. We're using two shelf brackets. And um, on top of it, I have an old computer that my friend uh, Jack donated. And um, he also donated this monitor, and my roommate donated this uh, this keyboard. I had to actually paint some letters back on the on the keys, but you know what? It works. I still want to make sure. Also, I, I think um, Paul for donating a computer. He donated a laptop or two. Anyway, so um, so we got it going. To get it working, uh, I have to make sure the other end's plugged in and it powers up the whole thing. And uh, I give it, uh, I have the e-switch out in order to uh, power up all the uh, drivers. Right now the system is booted um, and uh, I log in. So this is Linux CNC and um, I'm sorry I don't have a screen capture program going but I'm going to be doing less on the screen than um, uh, and, and, and more in real life so this is what I'll have to do for now. Some of this glare is actually from the desktop pattern they used oddly enough you'll see. Anyway so what is Linux CNC? So Linux CNC is kind of a system to run a CNC machine. and. Um, and not only that, it could be used for other things too. It's very adaptable. And they've taken this system and they've coupled it with, um, uh, with obviously, a Linux distri distribution with a low latency kernel. And the idea is that you can grab, um, a, a, you know, a, a, you can even use old hardware like I have and um, put this on it and hook it up to hardware and have it work your machine. So looking around, if you click here in Applications menu, uh, which is like the Start menu under Windows, um, uh, you can see there's a CNC menu here. But there's also some other things here, such as VLC for playing videos. You've got a browser. You've got a copy of the GIMP. You've got um, uh, some some development tools for working on user interfaces, uh, so you can make your custom own custom user interface. Um, um, you also have a full copy of LibreOffice. Um, I think this it could even be a little lighter than this if it's going on small machines, but this operating system is small compared to a copy of Windows. Anyway, so let's, and if you look here in the, under CNC menu, you normally when you're setting this up, you would use the StepConf wizard. And so basically it's a Windows style wizard and you just give it all the parameters and change the settings and it creates um, two files basically or modifies two files one is called a HAL file and HAL stands for hardware abstraction layer and the other is an any file and if you use Windows you're familiar with those and if you're using if you're using a Mac it would be like a P list I guess um, so anyway you would normally run this but before you do that you, if you get a machine especially a laptop many laptops won't work because they have latency issues so you might want to run this latency test and run it for a while and antagonize your computer while you're running it and um, to see if your latency is going to be okay a lot of even single core machines um, are okay of their desktops a lot of even decently um, um, decent um, and, and viable um, laptops may not be because um, they do special power management. If you're hunting on the side of a row for machines to run this, you know, grab a few, grab a couple extras and stuff. Um, I'm using a uh, Optiplex 755 and it seems to be working for me and um, it has a parallel port too, so that's nice. It's not so big and I like that.
Anyhow, you would normally run it with stepconf wizard, and, and so what, it, what it does is it creates a configuration and makes a launcher. The configuration lives inside this little um, um, this little CNC folder here. If we look inside this folder, we see a number of files. We have copies of some files and stuff, and I routinely make those. Um, usually, when I when I do any any major edits on the files, um, I make backups. And every once in a while, I make backups, and um, you could just you can just uh, take your in this case your um, any file in your hell. And you can right click and click and click select copy and then you can click elsewhere and click on paste and it'll also automatically put another copy or copy number four or what have you it's actually better in windows better in mac as far as it's concerned however i wish this was backwards i wish this was the, the name and dot, dot copy one copy two copy three so we can sort it by name. I wish it was the other way, but still, this is this is good because you can keep on making copies without having to re, uh, rename anything. Anyhow, most of this stuff I don't think you're going to touch. What you might touch is there's an any file which you will likely touch, and a file, an HAL file or HAL file that you, which you may touch and have to edit. So. Um, so the any file, if you've used Windows, um, uh, it's you're familiar with. Um, if, if you use a Mac, it's like a plist. It's a bunch of configuration stuff. But this is more kind of a user base configuration, and it's the settings are kind of lighter tweaks and stuff. The HAL is um, the major settings. HAL stands for Hardware Abstraction Layer, which means if you have, um, suppose you have hardware. And you've got a, the program to run it. So there's another layer between these two other layers. And so that's the idea of it. So let's double click on the hell. And there's a big warning here and stuff like that. Um, this hell will be overwritten if you run step conf, conf. And basically that's what it does. If you have a really custom hell, you should probably at some point stop using step conf. For your, for, you know, if, it's, if, if, if you have to edit these files, you probably won't be running step conf anymore. And um, you should back up your files just in case. And in this case, a lot of people help me with this. And I'm up to version 0.9. Um, and as the notes say, it's modified for uh, step forward and step back, um, such as Vexta. And you can say I got a big thank you, Andy P Pug, um, Poe, uh, Tommy Light, um, Todd Zretcher, Arkai, and PWC. There's actually more people who help me than this. But I have to, when I, as I upload this, I'm going to edit the file and add those names. By the way, thank you very much. So what do we have in here? So we've got this, this hardware abstraction layer idea. And um, so basically, you're going to find, um, you're going to stuff, find stuff about hardware. You're going to find stuff about the signals and then variable names. The variable names it basically name the signals. So what does that mean? Let's take a look at this. And we'll, 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 first, we have some preliminaries to do. So there's some loads here. So there's this thing that says load root. And this is where it actually loads all the modules. So, so it seems that Linux CNC is basically, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's almost an operating system in itself. It's all modular. So when it's like load root, it's pretty much like loading DLLs in, in Windows or in Mac. I don't know what it would be doing. Um, quite frankly. Anyway, so we do some loads here. It's loading its components. We'll look at this one. So it's so it's it's saying load root how parallel port. So we're telling it to load this parallel port module on the root of its system, wherever it, where, however it may be. And we're in some configuration parameters. In this case, it's config equals, and there's a hexadecimal address of the parallel port, and then there's actually another keyword out for um, uh, I. I don't know why it says out, to tell you the truth, because the, the parallel port in this case both, but does both input and output. But what I do know is that you can have a, a more than one parallel port in Linux CNC, so um, that, that will come up later. And then we've got some other things, like uh, in my particular strange configuration that um, I had to change step gen. And so, so here we're loading root step gen is the, the step generation um, uh, function or module of Linux CNC, and we're giving it some parameters. We're telling it to, we're telling it to, to, you know, we're telling it to, to to make some weird steps here. In this case, it's changing modes and how it creates steps. 
Um, we also have some other things and stuff. There's, there's, there, it's setting up the threading and stuff as far as running the, the parallel port. Yeah. When I first created this configuration, I used step conf to create it, and then I modified it, and so I added all this stuff. Um, I also have some spindle motor stuff. I don't have a spindle on my machine. I've got to get one, so this is... Um, anyway, so this is untested, so we're not going to talk about that. Um, um, I want to skip down here first. So, so basically, this is I'll show you the basics of how, basically what Linux CNC does. So, as far as hardware, <clears throat> so it has here. Yeah, it's got this this command called net, which you could think of as network, but I think of it as connect. So what it's telling you to do is connect, and we have a variable name. In this case, it's X up, and it's connecting this variable name to a hardware port, which is the parallel port zero. So it's parallel port dot zero, just because I only have one, and it's giving it a pin. And what kind of what kind of out what kind of stuff are we talking about here? Like the Arduino, it's in this case it's output. It's it's you know in some ways. In some ways, this is like this is like an Arduino, um, uh, like a pin mode in Arduino, and we're setting the pin mode more or less for output if you work with Arduinos. But in this case, we're giving a, a variable name, just kind of like you would do, uh, like in, a per, in an Arduino program. So this 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 isn't that foreign, although we're using this re, this redirection um, um, modifier here. Um, I've read that that may or may not be necessary, and um, in this case, these are outputs. And so I've got them for, um, for, for, for X, Y, and Z for going in each direction. But this, once again, this is a strange setup. You would do, you would do a step pin and a, and a direction pin. So it would be X dir or something like that. Anyway, so we also have some, some inputs. We're going to take, um, we've, got, um, we've got this combination um, minimum and home switch. And that's actually an input for the parallel port. And we're telling it it's an input here. And then we've got an E stop. And then here, if you put dash not, and this flips, this flips its functionality, as it were. And I also have a thing for a probe in here. I don't have a probe hooked up yet. Um, going back here, um, there's also even these things. And this is one change I wish there was. I wish I could put a not for the outputs, but you can't. Like, if, if I wanted this thing, and it's really supposed to be normally high and then pulled down low, but, uh, but you can't do dot .NET here. Instead, you've got to do this thing. You, you, you use this other set P to, to, to kind of change the parallel port function and which, which one, which pin, and then tell it to invert it. But I wish we could just put a, a, dot, a dot .NOT in there instead. Anyway. So, um, so then, um, then there's setup setups for each axis, and um, in this case, we'll look at the x-axis, and this is timing. This makes the waveform. So, so the waveform would go like this, and so we've got the the step length, which would be the high portion, and the step space, which would be the low portion, and then there's the direction delay. How you know how how fast can this thing switch before between forward and back? What does the driver need? basically to change directions how much time and um, I've written um, step motor programs before and um, so this is this this is not totally foreign to me and um, it's funny to see the parallels and stuff anyway we got some other settings some of this a lot of the stuff I didn't mess with but the one thing that is worth looking at is that so we created these signals up here we created it, it what basically are called signals so net X up this is a variable name. This tells, we said, we want to network or connect this variable name to this pin. So now this pin, so when we want to talk about the parallel port pin, we use the, code, the, the, the variable name XUP or the name XUP. But down here, we're actually, um, we're actually saying we're going to take this variable name and now hook it up to our step generator. So um, that we actually invoked way above. So so now we're taking we're taking the output of the step generator and shoving it into the uh, into the other side of our variable name stuff. And I have this thing for a manual tool change. Uh, this is all set up for you and stuff. And the e stop is also set up um, automatically with the step conf wizard. 
So this is very elegant. This is very powerful. Um, um, like I said, they're synthetically. Um, I wish we could put a dot knot, uh, a dot knot uh, uh, at the end of this. But um, so, unfortunately, I do have a scary appreciation of what this thing is. Most of it is really logical when you think about it. You have, you have some piece of software. You have so, you have some piece of hardware, and you have a name signal that connects these things. So you can change either of these things. So the idea of abstraction is to is to put a divider between these two things. So if you're looking here, you also see there's um, uh, an any file. And uh, double clicking on this file, there's another warning here saying that this would be overwritten if you run step conf. So it's important if you have really custom configurations that you back up these files and back them up often. And it's it's not it's not that all that difficult to, to do. So looking in this file, you've got headings and, and, and settings. Basically, that's what it is. And um, I think the idea of the HAL, uh, the HAL file basically gets your hardware talking you know, to, to, to Linux CNC. And this really kind of it tunes it. So basically, you can think of it any as kind of a tuning thing. And a lot of this display stuff is unique to um, the Axis um, user interface. And you have to be careful. I've, um, I, I don't know why, I, I, I see, see sometimes, you, you know, it's clever, you know, to um, name something like, like a user interface axes. I mean, we're talking about CNC, right? So it's clever. Unfortunately, when it comes time to explain to somebody what it does, it's not so, it's not so straightforward. So I actually put a message about that, but, um, uh, be forewarned, the, 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 one of the user interfa interfaces for Linux CNC is named Axes, and I wouldn't want to write documentation for that. So, so basically, uh, we have variable names and settings and stuff in here. And um, so, um, like the display, this is our um, this is our GUI, and it's actually named Axes. And once again, our editor is called gedit. So, if you edit a G code file, it would launch. This was probably gedit. I mean this program here. So the axes are numbered from zero on, so zero, one, two, um, if you have a three axis machine. And if you have a three axis CNC machine, it's probably set to linear, which means your motors turn turn rotary motion like this, it, you know, moving the ball screw in a linear fashion, even though the motor's rotary, the motion is actually um, linear. Um, and this tells it where you where where home is, and uh, this max velocity is how many units. What's the maximum speed you want to go? And uh, the acceleration is is how fast do you want the motor to go from a stop to running to running to running? You know how fast do you want it to accelerate? Like your car, how like if you're driving a car, how 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 heavy do you want to push on the accelerator pedal from a, from a stop sign? basically that's what it is in this case it's a hundred it might be it might be a hundred I don't know I'm guessing I'm just guessing but in my case it might be a hundred millimeters per second per second or something like that and then the step gen max acceleration I haven't changed yet so the scale thing here is how many steps per a millimeter and um, in my case, it's set to 50 steps per millimeter. If I put a micro-stepping, I'd have to change this to 100 steps per millimeter. Um, you might have, like, um, like, like if, you used, uh, if you're in, in the U.S., you might have so many steps per inch, like 200 steps. Like, most motors are, like, 200 steps going around in one revolution. And uh, depending on what kind of screw you have, so you have to calculate, you know, how many... How many threads are in your in, are in your ball screw or lead screw, and how much how many steps are in your motor? And if you crank up the micro stepping, this changes too. This error here has to, and I haven't changed changed this. This has to do with when when uh, Linux CNC is going to move. It kind of creates a trajectory kind of list. It, it kind of picks a direction and says, "I'm going to go that way using these two motors," and it tries to do the best it can. And um, I think that at some point it makes approximations. And I think this is how tight do you want it to follow your approximation. And so anyway, I haven't had to change this yet. So this is actually the limits. Um, this max limit defines how big the axis is. How many, 
Hum, okay. So we've got the scale is 50 steps per unit. Now, how many units? Hum, in this case, how many millimeters? How many millimeters long is my is my x-axis? And in, in, in this case, it's 910. And before it before it hits the switch. Um, so so there's some there's some homing stuff. Um, first of all, I'm going to skip down here, and that's the search velocity. When you're searching for your limit switch, how fast do you want it to go to find your, your, your limit switch? And in my case, I don't want it to go very fast. You have this, you have this condition where when it's trying to find the limit switch, the, the thing will accelerate, right? It's turning, it's turning, it hits the switch, it's got to stop dead. So when it does that, I think it's kind of hard on the screws and everything. So I keep this low. I don't mind. It's, in my case, I, I, I don't want it to search very fast. So I use a number. It's, it's probably eight, um, eight, 8 millimeters per second or something. So that's pretty slow, and I'll show you that. And, and some of this homing stuff will make more sense when I'm actually showing, showing it to you. And so it's searching slow. And um, in this case, for some reason, I needed to put a minus here. And once again, thank you to everyone in, uh, in the Linux CNC forum. Somebody had posted about this. There's, there's something about my machine that it ha probably has to do with my strange motors that you might not have to do this. So imagine, if you will, the search velocity is 8. So it's going 8 units this way. And, and then it hits the switch. It says, ah, I see a switch, right? Now to keep on ba ba backing off into the switch opens again. In this case, that's the latch velocity, I believe. So now it's open again. So now they're just about touching. And there's also an offset. In this case, I want it to move five millimeters away. It goes, it finds the switch, and it makes contact with the switch, and then it slowly backs off and, and to, and, until the switch opens again, and then it moves an additional thing to make sure the switch is totally disengaged. And that off, the other offset is the home offset. And you need this because if you don't put a, well, I needed this, I should say, because um, using just one set of switches, the switch has to be disconnected or it'll get of an error. And um, in this case, while you're homing, you ignore the limits because the, the limit switches and the homing switches are both the same. And you have a homing sequence. And I should think that on most CNC machines, you would, you would actually home the z-axis up first to get the bit out of the way so when you move it across or this way it doesn't snap off the bit so and then it just follows that for the for um for the other two axes and um so that's most of the indian stuff there's some other things in here that are unique and peculiar to um each user interface First, I want to apologize about the lighting on this end of the garage. is terrible. I have the garage door open. Um, there's no lights over here, so there's not much I can do. I originally planned to rent a space. Um, we're using some of the money that YouTube said that they were going to give me, but did not. I'm reminded that at one time, Google had a motto, don't be evil. And I guess I forgot about that motto. I've been told that this machine is actually a little bit bigger in real life than it appears in the videos. The work envelope is roughly three by four feet which equates to some 14 by 1600 millimeters. And um, I wanted, I didn't want to make it too tall because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to make the gantry strong enough. So I've got about 120 millimeters of, um, of, of height here, and which is about, see, about four inches. And I thought that'd be enough to cut sheet metal and stuff like that, cut wood for guitar parts and stuff like that. Uh, for those of you that are, are sharp eyed, there's no spindle motor yet. Um, so, I'm on a tight budget here and a fixed income, and um, and uh, anyway, so I'm gonna I'm probably gonna get a spindle motor. This, which is really insane, because I live in Silicon Valley. There's no housing, and um, I could end, I actually end up living on the street. And um, but I'm one of those people. I try to finish what I start, and um, that's been part of my. Yeah, my identity, and I, I like that about myself. And even if I only get to cut one piece of metal, I'm going to get a spindle motor because the Cartesian coordinates. The machine usually homes this way, so you won't see most of this back here. Right now, I only have the uh, main power switch and the e-stop um, clamped onto the corner of the machine. Um, unfortunately, I need to put a length in the wires for this, and um, I want it to live on the monitor or near the monitor with the monitor at some point, and. Um, 
I thought I had enough for cable, but I don't. Anyway, so I wanted the emergency stop and the main power switch to be the same switch. So, like, every day, I get used to touching the emergency stop. So if something goes wrong, I know where it is. And just doing this a couple of times right now, I know where it is. And um, I think it's a little weird to have the emergency switch and the on-off switch separately because you won't get used to touching the emergency switch. So I have the computer booted into Linux CNC. Um, because I installed my Linux CNC from the distribution, it's paired with um, XFCE for window manager. And XFCE is a small, lightweight mi window manager, something like you would use in a Raspberry Pi. And um, um, one thing I don't like that they did with it is they there was um, a, a Mac style docket here at the bottom and I think that for like a CNC machine I feel that that, that takes up too much real estate. So one thing I did was I copied all the icons or moved all the icons over here and then I deleted this little dock thing and you have the facility to do that. Just make sure you make sure you don't delete all the, the, uh, the launchers and stuff like that. To launch Linux CNC, oddly enough, I double click on this launcher here. And uh, after the splash screen, I maximize it. And right now the machine is emergency stopped and off. And this is the emergency stop icon and this is the off icon. You can see that the off icon is grayed. Um, to, um, to shut off the emergency stop, I would press F1 or this button right here. And to turn on the machine, I would press F2. Now the machine is on. So you can change the axes by pressing like X, Y, and Z. Um, right now the machine is not homed. I know it's not homed because these, these indicators right here don't have a little uh, homing indicator in front of them. And um, you can still move it around. Um, like if, if, um, if I want to move the X axis, I could just move, use the arrow keys. And it's moving painfully slow. And um, so the, right down here, there's a thing for jog speed. And we can bring that up. Yeah, that's a little more peppy. Yeah. Using the um, right and left arrow keys for the x-axis. Um, for the y-axis, I'm moving the up and down arrow keys. And um, for the z-axis, I'm using the page up and page down keys. And this machine can move fast enough where it shakes the whole cart. The, the structure itself is pretty strong. If you have your um, homing switches set up, you could just press home all and home all the axes. So if you just want to do one for some reason, you could choose an axis such as X, Y, or Z, you can see them change. But right now, we'll just try the X axis. And um, there's no homing indicator set right now, so we know it's not been homed. And um, to home the X axis, we press the, um, the home button on the keyboard. And this is the... Um, this is the home search velocity, and this is why I don't want it too um, fast because when it stops, it's going to stop all of a sudden with no deacceleration. Once it finds the switch, it's going to use the latch velocity, and you might just barely be able to see it turn. And uh, right now, that you can see this, might be able to see this coupler is turning. And then it did a little jump. That was actually the home offset, so that's how it homes in access. And once again, if you want to do all of them, you would just press the... Um, the home all button on user interface and there's the um, Z axis. There's a home sequence and, and you want your home sequence to be set in such a way that it homes the Z first to, to get it out of the way so you don't break off bits. So all three axes are homed. You might be able to see the little homing indicators. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this thing kind of where a simulated work piece would be. I don't have a spindle motor but still it'll be fun. Anyway, I'm going to move the um, y-axis back and actually the x-axis at the same time and uh, maybe lower the uh, z-axis a little bit, something like that. Imagine if you will there was a, imagine if you will there was a spindle motor here and um, I think I'm going to go ahead and get it. Anyway, so um, if we, uh, right now if the bit was just touching the corner of the workpiece we would click on this touch off thing. And um, there's no offsets in this case. And we would do that for the um, x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. And uh, just imagine if you were worse, but where we are in a workpiece. And this shows basically where I am as far as the machine is concerned. You might not be able to see this. 
Anyway, to uh, run the code, we would uh, push this run button, and it will, and then it would start running the code. And we can zoom in a little bit. Basically, it's 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 basically uh, tracing out Linux CNC, and um, the mi this machine has got some resonances. Uh, so I'm f hoping and thinking that it, uh, that part of the reason is it, is it's strong, and uh, so the steps go all the way through the machine. So. I also want to say thank you to uh, everyone at Linux CNC for their, their technical help, and um, some of it was just with the interface, which wasn't you know anything to do with Linux CNC, but still they stepped up and helped me, and I appreciate I appreciate that. I also want to say thank you to Jack for donating this older computer to me, and um, it's working really well for this machine. Thank you very much.